Hi everyone, I see that we have four people on. I wanted to let you guys know that we'll be starting in three minutes. Um, we will be live. Keep in mind that we will be asking questions at the end. So feel free to submit those in the, um, you know, in the chat or the comments and we will get to them at the end. Thank you, see you in a few. Hi, Hi, everybody. Hi. Thanks for tuning in. We are here with Maricel Vera. She is the author of A Taste of Sugar. Um, and before we get started, I just wanted to say Maricel is a Pittsburgh Latina and a Boricua. Um, she is a tremendous asset to our community and a wonderful friend. Uh, the Taste of Sugar is a story of Puerto Rico told through two families um, of Valentina Sanchez from Ponce. Um, and she dreams of living in Paris and having this, you know, beautiful life, being swept off her feet. And Vicente Vega, who's a coffee farmer who's really rooted in the land. Um, after Vincent, Vicente and Valentina marry, they struggle to keep their farm and raise their family through the various calamities that happen to them and Puerto Rico. And this includes the Americans invading their land um, during the time of the Spanish-American War, as well as the great hurricane that occurred during that time. So as you can see, the book is already super relevant to so many things that we're going through today and we are just so excited to have you. Thanks for tuning in and thank you for being here, Maricel. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you, Melanie. How are you? You know what? I am wonderful. This is our first part of the speaker series. Um, we are going to have a speaker every month um, and hopefully it's something that grows and grows so we can help educate the community and get the word out there that Latinos are doing amazing things in the community. Um, so first, I wanted to get to know a little bit about you um, so that our audience could become familiar. Did you always want to become an author? I knew that I was a writer when I was about uh, 13 years old because that's when I wrote my first short story. I uh, was assigned in my English class and during that time in, when I, in Chicago, um, where I grew up, uh, something really bad happened. Um, in this neighborhood uh, called Pilsen. Um, the landlords were paying the arsonists to go and uh, set fire to these buildings where Mexican immigrants lived. And because a lot of the immigrants didn't speak English, they couldn't shout fire and they couldn't let the, uh, the firemen were all um, non 
Spanish speakers, they were just white uh, Americans. They didn't know the word fuego in Spanish. And so they didn't go to those uh, voices and a lot of people died. And uh, in the Chicago media, a lot of people blamed the uh, immigrants for not knowing English. And that just really made a huge impression on me. It made me think, um, that's not right. People need to tell their stories and and people need to understand that we're all the same. And that I think inspired me to sort of choose my subject, social justice in a way, uh, telling um, people's stories who are uh, the stories who that aren't normally told. Okay, well, you, you talked a little bit about the Chicago media. Can you tell us about where you're from? Uh, I am a born and bred Chicagoan. I was raised in a Puerto Rican family as a Puerto Rican. And that, um, because I grew up in Chicago, was very complicated, complex. I lived in two worlds and sort of had like a double consciousness. And I think that it was really good training as for a writer. It was not so great as a human being, maybe, but um, very interesting for a writer. That's great. Well, it's it's definitely important to draw inspiration from where you're from. So can you tell us a little bit about why you are so passionate about your Puerto Rican ancestry and what inspired you to write? Uh, what inspired me to write this book? Yes. Well, I think um, while I was conducting research for my first novel, If I Bring You Roses, I stumbled upon this fact that over 5,000 Puerto Ricans had gone in 1900 to 1903 to work in the sugar cane, Hawaiian sugarcane plantations. And I just found that astounding that that happened in 1900 because people complain now about how far it is to go to Hawaii. And can you imagine how it must have been then? Um, and as I um, continue to do research about these 5,000 Puerto Ricans, I learned that it was really the second time in Puerto Rico that um, this kind of exodus had been sponsored by the American government. The first, the second time, that was the first time. And the second time was in the 1950s when my parents uh, left Puerto Rico um, to come to Chicago and work in the factories. So that I thought was really fascinating. Why do people leave? What was happening in the world at that time that they felt they had to take to me, I thought was an extreme measure to go someplace uh, like Hawaii where in that period they might never return uh, back to their families. And that was, that was just the beginning of the research that um, intrigued me. That, um, and uh, also the more I researched it, the more I learned and the more I understood that I didn't know anything about Puerto Rican history. I, I, I sort of knew that, but it just, as I discovered Puerto Rican history, I discovered that um, I was very, I knew I was proud about being Puerto Rican, but I discovered the foundation that uh, made me understand why, like my roots, I sort of discovered my roots. And um, with this, these discoveries that were many and ongoing, I also shared them with my mother because my mother also didn't know Puerto Rican history. My mother was a, an excellent student in Puerto Rico. She graduated from high school. She loved history. What she knew was American history because uh, Puerto Rico as a colony, um, especially during that time, there wasn't any, um, let's say, uh, what was taught was American history because they didn't have any agency to teach Puerto Rican history. It was what I wouldn't want to say the master, but what the colonizer decided. And the education ministers in Puerto Rico were all Americans at that time when my mother was growing up. And this is a history that they thought Puerto Rican kids should know. And that's what my mother knew. And um, I, as I learned, I told my mother what I learned and she was very, very gratified to learn because it was something that, she was missing and maybe she didn't know that she was missing. 
I want to talk to you a little bit about that history that you're talking about that you learned. And I think it's really a forgotten history that we don't talk about very often. Um, first of all, what was the process like for doing all of that research? Well, I just started with an idea. When I started to write a book, I start with what interests me so much that I'm willing to work years on it because that's how long it takes me um, to complete a novel. And that what really intrigued me with this book was why, why did these Puerto Ricans leave uh, Puerto Rico in 1900 to go to Hawaii? Who were these Puerto Ricans? And from there, I sort of worked backwards. I, um, because I'm interested in uh, history and Puerto Rican history, you can't, when you write something like this, uh, let's say they left in 1900 to go to uh, Hawaii. You can't just write about 1900. You have to know what happened in 1850 or in 1875 when they were born because it's people don't make decisions just on the spur of the moment. We don't make decisions like that now. There is something historical, something in your background that motivates this action. So I um, started with that thought and I researched Puerto Ricans in Hawaii, Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico, what was happening in 1875 in Puerto Rico. That led to what was happening in 1850. Um, and I learned, when I learned about um, the uh, US invasion in 1890, uh, 1898, that was super interesting. Why did that happen? What was happening beforehand that in the world? Because we're all connected, even, even though we don't know that we're connected. In the novel, The Taste of Sugar, my characters, Valentina Sanchez and Vicente Vega, don't understand that what's happening uh, to them on their little farm up in the mountains of Utuado, um, it's happening because what's happening in the outside world. You know, it's happening because of what happened in the US with the Civil War. Um, it, it's happening because um, they, uh, the United States needs people to um, buy their products. So they need the Puerto Ricans to buy their products. Anything that's going into Puerto Rico is pretty much imported uh, because it's an island. And uh, it had already, through the Spanish, had already had a system of colonialism where they, um, they had to import things from Spain and for other countries because basically it's all about money, capitalism. Um, and then um, when the Americans want to expand, they also are looking around to see, hey, we need a military base, where's a good location? Uh, Puerto Rico is a perfect location. And so that's one reason that they want it in Puerto Rico. So they want Puerto Rico for the location, the military location, because they want the Puerto Ricans to buy more of their products. Um, they wanted uh, cheap labor. And so what's happening on, in the book, um, somehow um, there's like a thread with the world. Um, the Civil War, what is really kind of interesting about the Civil War is that um, some of the generals that were in the Civil War were the ones that invaded Puerto Rico. And I found that really interesting and fascinating. All these little things that the more research you do, you it leads you to something else that's really fascinating and the process. I, I find it so fascinating. Reading the book, it really opened my eyes. Um, you know, I had already heard a little bit about the book, but I didn't anticipate how much I was going to learn and how much of that isn't taught in school today. Um, and it's all still a part of life. Um, and on that topic, um, with the history of the relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States. Can you speak a little bit on the topic of colonialism, um, as well as the United States actually possessing Puerto Rico and what that means for Puerto Ricans, both in Puerto Rico and the United States? Well, I thought it was very interesting. Recently, the president said that he thought about, well, we learned that the president had spoken about uh, selling Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, and people were shocked by that and thought it was, oh my God, such a terrible thing to actually say. But you know what? The president could sell Puerto Rico, I think, 
um, if he got U.S. Congress to okay it. That's what colonialism means. You don't have any rights of your own. Uh, there is another country, the United States, that really runs Puerto Rico. Uh, recently, the governor of Puerto Rico, I think, considered uh, closing the airport because of the virus and keeping um, people out, tourists out, sort of like containing uh, the virus in Puerto Rico and trying to deal with it that way. But the governor doesn't have that power to close the airport in Puerto Rico. Only the federal government has that power. So that's what colonialism means. You don't have any power. I think that it's really amazing that you are so dedicated to telling this untold story of Puerto Rico. You know, you didn't just write a novel, you wrote the history and you are educating people. And I, I wanted to show everyone the book. Um, you can get it digitally, you can get it online, you can get it at any of your local bookstores, Amazon, whatever it may be. Um, one of the things that I really enjoyed in the book, let me just open it up to the page, was you even included a map of Puerto Rico. And throughout the book, she does talk about the different travels and the different cities and things like that. Um, and that brings me to our next question. Um, when we first spoke and I was looking for the book, um, I asked you if there was an audio version out and your answer was very fascinating to me. Can you share why there was a delay in the audiobook? Well, I really wanted a Puerto Rican or a Latina to narrate it. I thought it was, I think it's very important for me to have, I preferably a Puerto Rican or a Latina because I think that we don't have a lot of opportunity in publishing. Um, as Latinas, it's very, very hard to get a book published in general. And it's really hard if you're a POC. So um, I thought I have this um, opportunity to decide who narrates my novel because my agent was brilliant and put it in the contract when she sold the book to the publisher. And um, I was gonna go for it. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, I had to choose whether or not to get it done months ago and have it come out um, when the physical book came out or wait until who knows when. And I have to say that I really did have the support of my editor and my publisher. I never felt like, okay, you have to do this because whatever. But it was very clear and they told me, it's cool, you can wait, but you know, you'll have to probably wait until the fall because in the, um, the publisher of the audio book um, needed somebody who has a professional studio to record it. And the people that they offered um, to me were not Latinas. And I wanted to wait until I got a Latina and I'm happy to say that I do have a Latina. So it's going to be recorded in September. So. That is awesome. <laughs> and that is the type of dedication that um, those of you who haven't read the book, I hope that you do. It's extremely great. Like I said, you can get it anywhere. Um, but that dedication really shows through in the book um, and all the historical accuracy. And it's, it's really amazing. Um, so thank you for that. Um, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about the publishing process now that you brought it up. Um, as a Chamber of Commerce, you know, we have a lot of people who are interested in writing books, think they may want to someday, but they have no idea where to start. Can you share with us a little bit about your experience with the publishing process and give us advice for aspiring writers? Okay, advice. <laughs> you got to want to really, really bad. That's, I think, is the main thing. You have to, uh, as a fiction writer, uh, if that's what you want, you have to, that's what you want more than anything. And you are willing to do whatever it takes um, to get there. Uh, knowing that you don't know if you're going to get there. Um, so I think like writers are kind of like actors. Um, there's a lot of rejection and uh, maybe the one, the people that make it, they definitely have luck but they also are willing to do whatever 
it takes and however long it takes to get to where they want to. So that's my story. <laughs> but, I, but, I think yeah. you really undersell yourself. <laughs> it also takes talent and you're tremendously talented. <laughs> <laughs> well, but like, okay, so like advice for an aspiring writer, well, that. Mm -hmm. And also learn the craft. If you are really interested uh, in fiction, then maybe, hopefully you've been reading uh, like you're possessed since you were a small child, like I, I did. Because I think when you, it's sort of like being an athlete. You don't, um, you wanna be a baseball player. You don't think that you're gonna go into the major leagues or maybe even the minor leagues um, without ever playing as a very small child. I think um, that's how you get skilled by doing it as a very small child. And I think that's the same way with writing. Um, because reading, reading trains your, your, your brain. It opens up your world to words. Um, it, um, it, there's just, it, writing a novel has a very um, high level of components, I think. And so you have to learn the craft. And if you already have been reading as a small child, well, at least you kind of have an idea. Um, if you want to write nonfiction, um, then maybe you want to take a non, right now everything's online, an online class. I took like a, a poetry class at my junior college when I first started writing because I was really interested in the rhythm of words. And I also thought that writing a novel was such a huge endeavor. There's no way that I could have done it then. So, <laughs> so that's what I think. Read. I, just, I wanted to get this up. We had a shout out from Ron Alvarado. Um, he okay. wants everyone to buy the novel, of course. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. <laughs> um, no, that's wonderful. And I think that, you know, having that drive and that persistence, it, it really shows through. Um, but for a lot of people, when they look at the publishing process, it's so much more complex than that. Um, beyond talent and beyond drive, what is the first step that someone can take to actually seeking out a publisher and, and getting their, their book out there? Well, I think it works differently between with uh, nonfiction and fiction. So I think with nonfiction, if you have a really great idea, uh, you can write sort of like a um, uh, an outline and uh, maybe like a couple pages. To, to show the quality of your writing. And then you have to get an agent. I think in general, you need an agent. When it comes to fiction, you need an agent. Unless you have a short story or something like that, that you um, won a big award, um, you submitted it to some literary magazines and you bought, um, and, and you won an award. So then maybe the agent will come looking for you. But in general, you go looking for the agent. And an agent is somebody who represents you at the publisher. They um, have the connections with editors in publishing and um, editors trust them. And like my agent, um, she um, submitted my book and to, to editors that she knew and with like a cover letter and I'm, I'm thinking, or else maybe she had lunch with them. So uh, that's, you need an agent. I don't know that you can get published without an agent because they have, um, editors have so many books to read and it's like not even their main job. I, they also edit. Yep. So um, with agents, how do you find an agent? There is a book called it sort of looks like kind of like a dictionary and an encyclopedia it's called like writer's digest or something like that mm -hmm. if you look if you google it it'll have the list of all the agents um it has a list of um writers that they represented what they look for i think right now if you're a fiction writer they'll take like three pages you write three pages and they judge you on the three pages do they like your writing do they like your idea and if they do, they get, they'll get back to you. It's just like anything, it's very competitive, but I wouldn't say um, don't give up. I am like the poster child for not giving up. And uh, you know, 
if that's what you want to do, go for it. <laughs> I want to talk about that for a little bit, actually. I was shocked the first time that we spoke. Um, you know, you had such highly acclaimed reviews in the Washington Post, on um, the New Yorker, um, you're on Oprah's summer reading list, and so many more um, other compliments and things I've heard. When you told me about your first book, that it was actually remandered, I was very surprised. Can you tell us, first of all, for those who don't know what it means for a book to be remandered, what that was like and how you overcome that, overcame that to have your second book become already so successful in only what the first 30 days it's been released? Something like that. Yes. Um, well, being remandered means if your book is remandered, that means that you didn't make enough copies. The publisher doesn't want to support your, um, trying to sell the book um, and uh, because they don't think they're going to make money. It's all about the money. Publishing is about the money. And also for some people, it's also about, uh, I, I do think that there are people who hopefully are in publishing because they love books. And I, I really feel that support with Live Right, my present publisher um, and the team there. But with my first book, I don't even think it was out a year and it was remandered and that means they call up all the copies from the warehouse this is my imagination i don't know if it, this is exactly how it works but i'm thinking they take all the copies that haven't been sold and then they have this huge machine and that pulps it because that's kind of what happens I, and i don't know what happens after that or maybe that's not it maybe they they take the uh, the books and they um sell them uh, to secondhand shops and they sell them for $2. So maybe they sell them to secondhand shops for $3. I don't know. But I have to tell you, when I got that email from my first editor to say that it was remandered, I wasn't even living in the US. I was living in Switzerland at the time and I was crushed, crushed. <laughs> because I worked on that book for quite a few years. It, it's uh, I did a lot of history, put a lot of love, and I think it's still a beautiful book. And I personally didn't think that, um, I was too surprised because I don't feel that I had the um, support for uh, the publication, the marketing of the book that I have with this book, The Taste of Sugar with Live Right. So it's like, that's why I say I'm the poster child because I was like remandered and now, you know, now people I'm getting like some good press. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's been amazing. And we know that you're only going onward and upward from here. Um, and just to tell that tale, to have that underdog tale, you, you know, you already wrote a book that you were so confident in and for a lot of people, you know, they may give up, they may be discouraged. Mm -hmm. What was the moment when you said, that's it, I'm writing another book, I'm going forward, and how long did that process take? Oh, I never give up. I've always been writing. Um, I uh, This is what I've done for at least 20 years. This is what I do. Um, I also write short stories, none of which have been recently published, even though I have some really good ones. It's just... Um, it's uh it's hard it's hard it's hard to get published i think um in general but i never gave up i was just when i when i read this i was just determined to continue and write this story i'm presently working on another novel i mean this is what you do you just and when i reached out to my agent i'm like betsy can you believe that she's like yeah that's hard you know there's you just got to put it aside and just um keep writing, write another one. And I have to say that I'm really lucky because I've had the support of my agent all these years. Um, and she's made like no money on me because agents make money if you make money and I haven't made any money. So she's made no money, but she believes in my work as I believe in my work. And so we're a good team. <laughs> I would say that she has a good eye. Um, <laughs> The book, for those of you who do not yet know, um, the book is about 400 pages and- It goes quickly, I hope. I have to admit, I am not an avid reader. I do enjoy reading, but you know, you get busy. I picked up this book, like I said, I got a digital copy, copy originally on Amazon and I couldn't put it down even with 
work, watching my kids, et cetera. I watched it or I read it in four nights. Um, I, I couldn't put it down. It's a wonderful tale. Um, and I, with that, I want to shift gears a little bit um, and start to dive into some things about the book in our second half here. Um, a lot of the topics in the book are super relevant to, to, to mm -hmm. today. It discusses racism, classism, colorism, the hurricane, um, you know, similar to Maria, civil unrest, blended families, LGBTQ. I mean, I could go on and on about all of the ties between the time that the book's ta book takes place and now. Is that something that you planned? And can you discuss how that kind of unfolded? Um, you mean uh, the comparison between the past and now? Yeah, um, just no. that it's, it's so similar. We can yeah. identify with it so much. I think because um, I don't know that life really changes. We all have basically the same problems that our ancestors have. We just don't know um, what their problems were. But I think, you know, humanity is, is it's always the same. Uh, with um, the taste of sugar, in a way, uh, the coincidences are like unhappy coincidences. It's the hurricane, Hurricane San Siriaco, you mentioned, and that was in 1899, and it was a very powerful hurricane that uh, devastated a lot of Puerto Rico, and over 3,000 people died because of uh, similar reasons that uh, people died in Hurricane Maria. And uh, the infrastructure in Puerto Rico was in terrible shape. The Spaniards were uh, in, involved in Puerto Rico. They had Puerto Rico as a colony for like 400 years and they didn't put any money into the infrastructure. And then the Americans, uh, the year before Hurricane San Siriaco in 1898, they invaded Puerto Rico and they didn't put any money in the infrastructure either. And so then this powerful hurricane comes and it just rips off a lot of the trees in the island. People are li living in these little tiny shacks that are just like swept up by the hurricane uh, and they drown. Many, many people drowned. Um, and then, and then um, also um, they're hungry, um, which it's sort of like Hurricane Maria. People don't have shelter. They don't have food. They can't communicate. They couldn't communicate then either. So um, I thought that was very interesting how it, it was similar and how the treatment of Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico was similar to the Trump's administration treatment of Puerto Ricans and with Maria, because during uh, Hurricane San Siriaco, um, there was no FEMA. So there was no money to help the Puerto Ricans and the Americans were kind of obligated to help Puerto Ricans because they invaded Puerto Rico and they, at that time, they had a military government. So it was under military occupation. So they had to do something for the people. And because it wasn't a FEMA, President McKinley, who was a president then, he asked um, Roosevelt, who was the governor of New York, to do a, like a fundraising campaign and appeal to the American people through the newspapers for funding to help the Puerto Ricans. So that's what happened. Kind of like Hurricane Maria, the people who helped um, Puerto Ricans during Hurricane San Siriaco were basically the Americans. There was a little bit of money and a little bit of um, rations from the American military, but basically it was the American people who donated the money, who and it was funneled through charities, and that's how people were able to live in San, during San Siriaco time. Similar to Hurricane Maria with like Pittsburghers, the people in Pittsburgh, they, they donated so much money to help Hurricane um, yeah. Maria victims and people all over the world that was similar. Yeah, and on that, on that note, I want to thank you and your friends and family and everyone in the chamber who helped to raise those funds as well as the different sponsors, Highmark and the Pirates. Um, I think it's really great to see people coming together, um, but it would be great if the problems weren't there to begin with. <laughs> and you do talk a little bit in the book about the difficulties, especially when it comes to, again, the colonialism and, you know, the difference between being a Puerto Rican citizen and becoming American, being under Spanish rule. Um, can you talk about how that affects the characters in the book, those different roles and how they change? 
Well, I think um, at that time, once the Americans came in, uh, Puerto Ricans really didn't have a um, maybe statehood, not statehood or, um, well, they didn't know what they were because they weren't American citizens yet they and they weren't Spanish citizens anymore and they really didn't have a, an identity. They sort of belonged um, to, they belonged to Puerto Rico, but they didn't even have a passport. So uh, you couldn't, there was a story about this Puerto Rican who went to on a ship to New York and um, he wasn't allowed in during that period because he didn't have a passport because your Spanish passport is no good and because you're not a Spanish colony anymore and you're not an American, so you don't have an American passport. And um, colonialism during that time and even now, what it means is that Puerto Ricans belong to the United States, but uh, Puerto Rico is not a part of the United States. It belongs to the United States. There's actually a law um, that uh, the Supreme Court put into place in 1901 talking about that. And that's still the case now. Uh, Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico can't vote for um, president, yet they have a lot of taxes. Um, and that is something that happened then. And in my novel, uh, when the, I show that when the Americans come in, they sort of like um, throw uh, the society in disarray because they change the tax system. They did some good things like uh, before the Americans, a woman, people couldn't get divorced. So once the Americans came in because they're Protestants, they could get divorced. Nobody gets divorced in my novel, but that's something that happened. Um, and uh, they changed the taxes. Uh, during that period of the Spaniards, the Spaniards would tax the Puerto Ricans on their labor and on their crops. Well, once, um, so if you were a working man, you were taxed on your labor. If you had a farm, you were taxed on your crops. But once the Americans came in, they changed it and they started to tax you on your property, which was a terrible, terrible thing if you were a small farmer because you didn't have the money to pay the tax. And so if you don't have the money to pay the tax, eventually you're gonna foreclose. And, and then the hurricane comes in. And so that's, you know, they, they uh, uh, the Americans stopped the foreclosures for um, a, sh a short period of time. But then once that was lifted, what happens? You foreclose and what happens? You lose your farm and who buys it? Well, who's got the money? The Spanish landowners, some of them and the Americans. Did I answer your question? <laughs> you absolutely did. Okay. I I actually, you reminded me of something I wanted to touch on a little bit later. Um, you spoke a lot just now about the tragedies that happen in the story and the losses throughout the book. So when you're writing about these highly impactful events, you often choose to write pretty brief descriptions. Can you tell us a little bit about why that is and the emotional toll that these things took on you as a writer? Well, um, especially you might be talking about one of my characters, Valentina. Um, she, uh, Valentina Sanchez, uh, she is um, very um, heartbroken because of something terrible that happened to her. And so she's really grieving. And I think sometimes that when we grieve, the grief is so intense that we can't vocalize it, we can't verbalize it, we can't talk about it. And I think that is what happened to Valentina. When I write, um, I think about the character that I am writing about that particular day, day or at that particular time when I'm sitting at my desk or um, sitting in a chair with pen and paper. And I put myself in that character's place. Sometimes I say I hear their voice, but people think I'm crazy when I say that, but it's sort of like that. So I think, okay, today I'm gonna to write about Valentina and today I'm writing about Valentina uh, and what happened to her. And so then I uh, kind of like an actor does, you, you sort of become the person that is the my process. I don't know how the writers do it, but this is the way I do it. I think, okay, today I'm gonna to write about Valentina and I think about what Valentina is going through and uh, she was going through something so difficult for her that she couldn't 
she couldn't talk to even the, her loved ones about it. It was so intense that um, it, it could only come out in a few sentences. And when she, as she got better, then she was able to um, say more. Like when she spoke, I think she might have written a letter to her sister and she said more to her sister. So I, I think it just depends on the character. Um, and if the grief is so intense or the feeling is so intense, sometimes you can only feel it and you can't speak it. So <laughs> Definitely. And that comes really through in the letters. Uh, I want to talk from a literary perspective. Um, the book is narrated um, in a really beautiful way. We get all these perspectives from the characters through that narration, but your choice of including the letters, I think was an important one from that literary perspective. Can you talk about your decision to do that and why the tone of the letters, it has a completely different perspective than the narration? Well, I really wanted to use letters because I wanted one of my characters to uh, talk about an, another part of the island, San Juan, because I um, like I wanted Elena, uh, Valentina's sister, to go to San Juan so that she could write letters to Valentina and talk about what was happening there, um, because I wanted to have a um, a more comprehensive uh, view for myself and for the reader of what was going on in Puerto Rico. And because my main characters are up in the mountain of Puerto Rico, yet I wanted to write about this other part of Puerto Rico and I wanted to write about the Americans in this other part about Puerto Rico, I needed somebody to go there. And so I thought my perfect person to go there was Elena, Valentina's sister, uh, because she, um, she has this relationship already with Elena a loving relationship, an older sister type of relationship. She also is a more practical person and she could speak to what was going on in a way maybe that was a little less emotional that maybe that maybe Valentina would have written about it. So that's why I wrote those letters between the sisters. But also later on in the book, I chose to add some letters um, that Puerto Ricans in Hawaii wrote to various people, um, some relatives to a government official to show how um, the, the conditions that they found in Hawaii were not the conditions that they expected. And, um, and Valentina also writes letters to a couple of her family members and Valentina's letters are made up, I made them up, but um, a couple of the other letters are actual real letters that Puerto Ricans wrote to a government official in, um, I think it was in Puerto Rico, um, about the conditions in Hawaii. And um, I found it in a book. I believe I gave credit to the book in the back in the bibliography. And I translated it from English to Spanish because right now most of my readers are Spanish, uh, English speakers. English readers, but I thought it was important to uh, write and put those letters in so that you can get a more maybe immediate feel for how uh, the characters are feeling. And my goal as a writer is to have you feel what my characters are feeling. And in order for you to feel, Melanie, what they're feeling, I have to feel it. Uh, so that's kind of like the way I work. People tell me, oh, I could really feel it the way you put me in a place. And thank you, because that is my goal, to have you feel like you're there. And and uh, uh, and I, I fool around it sometimes. And I said, I'm sort of being like God. And that's kind of like the way I think about it. This is like my world. I'm creating these worlds. And I am uh, the mistress of these worlds and you know, get to do what I want. Goal accomplished because I laughed, I cried. Um, I don't want to give anything away, but there were a few times where I actually had to, you know, put the iPad down, sit and just mm -hmm. reflect on what I had just read and how it applies to the world today, my life, the future, everything. It's just amazing how you transport people. 
um, and the development of those characters like you were just talking about, I think is so important in making the characters come alive and feel real. I mean, I feel like I know these people. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how you develop those characters and are they based in any reality? Uh, well, I uh, basically I steal things from people who I know or um, <laughs> uh, um, my ancestors. Um, like I stole, in order to create Vicente Vega's character, he's the other main character in the novel, and he lives in Utuado. He's a, a small coffee farmer. Well, um, I learned that my great-grandfather uh, lived in Utuado. And when I was beginning to write this book, I'm like, man, if only I could find one of the, I think there were like five groups that went to Hawaii. I'm like, if only one of these groups, they came from this area, then I could place my family uh, I could I could write about that area because uh, one of the pleasures of researching for me is if I could research an area where my ancestors came from, then I, I sort of learn about my own personal history at the same time I'm trying to create a world for my characters. And so then I did learn that like the second group, there were people who came from an area near Utuado at Juntas and I thought, okay, that's close enough. Uh, and then when the hurricane came, um, when I learned about Hurricane San Siriaco, how it ripped off all, so many of the coffee trees in Utuado, where my grandfather was, my grandparents were living at the time. I'm like, yes, this was meant to be. Um, so those are little things that I sold. I, I also gave Vicente, his, uh, his name Vicente in honor of my mother's uh, father, Vicente, who I love very much. And um, I gave Vicente's family and Vicente, uh, this story about a pig. Do you remember the story about a pig, Melanie? Um, in the beginning of the Absolutely. book? Absolutely. That, that story was, it was very powerful, especially when it related to the family and how that memory stayed with them forever. And that story actually has stayed with me. I've thought about it quite a few times. Well, that story is sort of uh, a story of my family. Both my godmother told me about it once and then my mother told me about it once. And it, it was basically, um, there was this pig that was eating the vegetables that my grandfather had planted, uh, his neighbor's pig. And he went to his neighbor and said, hey, your, your pig is eating my vegetables. Can you do something about it? And the uh, neighbor said, too bad for you. So my grandfather, who was known to have a kind of, a strong character got really angry and he killed the pig. And so when the neighbor found out, he, you know, can imagine those old type Puerto Rican men, uh, how they dealt with stuff. Well, he came with his brothers looking for my grandfather and they found him and they knifed him and they left him for dead along the side of the road. This was, I think, in the 1940s. And by some miracle, some, uh, some guy was coming by um, in his car, saw my grandfather, picked him up, took him in his car to the hospital in Ponce, where my family came from. It wasn't Utuado, it was another part, but Nuelas. Um, it's, I can't imagine, it must have taken several hours to get there. But somehow my grandfather survived. He was in the, um, the hospital for like a month. And uh, when my godmother told me this story, mi madrina, when she told me this story, she said that um, it was a really hard time for the family because he was a breadwinner. She was very small. And it was in the 1940s, I think during um, uh, World War II. And there's, you know, the, everybody, there's like five kids and the neighbors helped out my grandmother by, giving uh, the family, you know, a few things to eat. But that that story really made a big impression on me. And I thought, this is a great story. I got to use it. So basically, I stole it and I kind of adapted it for my own needs because that's what writers do. <laughs> well, it's a very powerful story. And I think um, as you're describing it, I even felt that there was part of that story in another part of the book. Um, and it reminds me that I wanted to talk to you about the role of women and women's leadership in the book. This book was set in what feels like a very patriarchal and classist mm -hmm. society. And for me, it was really fascinating to see how the female characters just still found ways to show tremendous strength and leadership. Can you tell us why it was important for you to tell that story in the book? 
Uh, the story about women? Yes. Well, because I think that uh, women's voices are often silenced and especially I have found that to be true uh, growing up as a Puerto Rican woman. Uh, when I was young, this seems like incredible, but it's true. My parents taught us, the girls, that if you enter a room and men are talking, you stand there and you wait till the men acknowledge you. Like I had to wait till my father looked at me and nodded at me and gave me permission to speak. Um, so that infuriated me and I was already a rebel. I think I was born a rebel. And I, I felt like I was not allowed to speak. And even to this day, it makes me so angry that people say, oh, you are, you, you know, you sound like you're so angry. You, you, because I'm passionate. It's called passion. And how, um, you know, you have to work on your tone. No, I don't. And I won't. Uh, so Absolutely if I never do. You, never. <laughs> sorry. And I'm not going to because I have been silenced too long. And in the novel, The Taste of Sugar, I felt like that was very true for Elena and her sisters. They were raised a particular way, not just by the men, but also by the women, because I think that's a cultural thing, that it takes both the men and the women to raise young girls to uh, be silent and to take the uh, maybe abuse that you uh, are given and not allowed to speak against. Um, and uh, we were talking earlier about AOC. About yeah, that's actually, I was right? going to bring that up. So yeah. in a recent news story that I'm pretty sure everyone heard about, she said how her parents did not raise her to take a specific type of behavior from men or really anyone. Um, but in the time of the book, the women were really raised to be obedient, be quiet, um, and accept that anything that men threw their way. Can you share a little bit about that with us and how it relates to the book? Yes, and Melanie, I just want to clarify, I was raised exactly the same way as uh, Valentina in the book, um, which is why I know Valentina so well, because uh, there's a, a, a hundred year difference, but I mean, not really. Um, but with Valentina in the beginning of the book, she uh, something happens with her father-in-law and she does not tell anybody because she knows, she thinks, but it's true. She knows that she probably will be blamed for what happened. And uh, so she doesn't say anything. She lives with the secret. She doesn't say anything until many, many, many years later when she's in Hawaii and she feels like, you know, this is what happened. I'm going to um, tell my husband and he could just understand and whatever. It's, it, that's his choice, but this is what happened. And uh, Valentina grows during this period because of the, the uh, it's about only like a 10 year period. It seems like a lot longer because of all the things that happened, but it's just really a 10 year period. Uh, That's another thing that related to today so much. You know, it was this small period of their life. I think just since March, we all feel that way. It feels like we've oh, lived 10 years yeah. and how many months? <laughs> yeah, so right. So this 10 year period, Valentina, uh, she starts off as a young bride, a young girl, uh, there, her head in the clouds, uh, dreaming about Paris because she is so influenced by the books that she reads. And basically, they're like um, novela. They're novelas, you know, not probably not a lot of substance uh, intellectually. But it, uh, so she dreams about being the senorita in Paris and having all these lovers and just this glamorous life. She falls in love with this farmer who his life is far from glamorous. It's all about physical labor and the land. And uh, uh, when they're in Hawaii, by the time they get there, so many things have happened to them. Um, some of it personal, tra personal tragedies and, the, and other things, economic conditions, um, the Americans, the um, hurricane, the economy, and when they're in Hawaii, she has grown by this time to be a much stronger person because she has had to endure so much. And we know that, you remember that, what is it, the cliche, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger? Uh, well, I think, and that's kind of what happens to Valentina. You know, she's, her character is just, uh, and now she, um, she also, 
is wants to be strong for her daughter. She wants to be strong for her daughters. She has two daughters at this, at this time, and she she wants to be strong for them, and not just for them, but also for uh, the other children in, in her community in Hawaii. And she's not gonna she's not gonna you know just take what people said because you know it didn't work out when she did basically. So now she's gonna do it her way. <laughs> Yeah, that that was a, one of the great things in the novel. I think that, like we talked about before, the character development is something that's so strong um, and relatable, like so many other uh, things that we've discussed. Um, and one of those things that we have yet to discuss is the way um, that travel affects society. Um, in the book, American travelers really indulge in the beauty of the island at one point, um, but they seem to just look right past the Puerto Ricans or even look down on them, I would say. Would you say that that still exists in culture today, and is it a problem that we can overcome? Well, I'm going to say yes. That it, I feel like it's still a problem because uh, look what's happening in Puerto Rico now. Uh, the stories, haven't you read stories about American tourists coming to Puerto Rico and they refuse to wear the mask? Yep, um, that that reminded well, me so much of this conversation. Respect right there. You go somewhere and you don't want to follow the rules. Uh, but I think that, um, I think, yes, I think like in, in, in literature, as a writer, uh, I think that has happened to me as a writer. Uh, in terms of how difficult it's been to sell my work because um, other people who are not uh, Latinas have mm -hmm. written stories that have been published for a hell of a lot of money. And, uh, and whereas it's been very, very, very difficult to get my own work published. Yeah. I'm hoping things will change uh, now. I feel may I'm hoping that the uh, the present conditions uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement um, are improving everything for all of us. Hopefully, we all support Black Lives Matter. Um, but that um, I hope things are changing. Yeah, th there's a lot of discussion um, about that in the book too. Um, the colorism and mm -hmm. you know even slavery is brought up at one point. Um, and I think that the lens that it's seen through is really unique because for so long um, we've denied that widespread racism exists um, and that colorism exists. Um, and they, they actually talk about that at one point in the book um, through a biracial family. Would you tell us a little bit about why you chose to include that? Well, um, I think because I really looked at this book as sort of like, not just a story of two people, but the story of really being Puerto Rican about Puerto Rico, um, that was sort of like my framework. And if that is my framework, then I have to write not just about the good things to celebrate, but I also have to write about things that are not so pretty, uh, things that Puerto Ricans would like to hide. And I think that um, racism among Puerto Ricans is something that maybe some of us like to hide. Uh, and I, was I thought it was important to call it out. And I wanted to do it in a way that didn't continue the racism so I try to have a very delicate hand and be very, very careful with the choosing of my words. And I wanted to write about um, uh, how there was slavery in Puerto Rico uh, with the Spaniards. And that's not something that a lot of people maybe know because we don't know a lot of Puerto Rican histories. Why? I, you know, so... Um, <laughs> So I, I wanted to uh, write about also patriarchy and that, and I wanted to, and so I thought all of this, I kind of like relates to the culture. And I have uh, Vicente's uh, father um, have a black son from a black woman who's descended. She's a granddaughter uh, of a former slave, of, of an enslaved man, a black enslaved man in Puerto Rico. And I wanted to, um, write about the dynamics in the family, how 
he is accepted by some and not by others. Like, for example, his father. I don't think he has, he's ever really accepted by his father. Um, and I wanted to um, just show um, love for him and from him for other members of his family. Uh, love, um, the character's name is Raulito, so that is Vicente's half-brother. And I wanted to show the, the love between Raulito and his mother, Eusemia. And also the respect that um, Vicente gives Eusemia as his, the mother of his uh, brother. And um, I am hoping that I did a good job. I definitely think that you did. And even in saying those things, you reminded me quite a bit of the title of your book. Um, for those of you who don't know, the title is The Taste of Sugar. And what you were just saying for me, there are so many things that the whole time in the book I'm thinking, okay, why is this the title? It's something I just like to ponder. And it seemed like things like that, the treatment of Vicente to his brother. Um, and um, at one point there's a slave who's freed and he has this meal and you know he always remembers that and it stays with him. And there are so many things throughout the book that people hold on to to keep them going through that, those hard times. Um, and for me, that seemed like a taste of sugar. And no matter what's going on, you can always remember that one taste of sugar and it can get you through. And I really wanted to know why did you choose that? Um, and what's your perspective on what I thought it was? <laughs> well, I love to hear readers say that they're pondering the book. <laughs> that makes me very happy because I think like uh, the best books make you think after you close it, after you close uh, the covers. You know, you're, you feel like these people are real people. And if you feel like they're real people, I'm very successful. So I'm, as a writer, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad about that. For me, the taste of sugar is sort of like, um, it's a framework of the book. It's kind of uh, uh, the framework of um, colonialism uh, from the 400 years of the Spaniards, 100 years of the Americans. Of course, at that time it wasn't 100 years, it was, uh, three or four years of the American, so 400 years of the Spanish colonialism, three or four years of American colonialism. Um, but it's um, it's kind of um, maybe, uh, and also I think it's really imperialism, colonialism, that's what the taste of sugar means. The thirst, for me, the thirst for um, for money, for sugar, in uh in puerto rico um what do the americans do when they buy us buy up all this land really cheap from the americans and they basically push americans out to go to hawaii and also not just hawaii but other areas of the world what do they do with this land they um uh build sugarcane plantations sugar plantations in puerto rico and what do they do uh in hawaii again sugar plantations so that's so the, the taste of sugar is about uh, the framework of capitalism, imperialism, and also um, so that's like the big framework. And the mind and the smaller sugar uh, framework is like you were saying, like the, the joy of life, um, the sweetness of your wife's smile or the sweetness of listening to your children sing a song, you know, um, standing out on your land and just feeling uh, your ancestors. Uh, and it's just, it's a very multi-level, hopefully sensory experience. And then also it was a, a intellectual um, experience for me. And the, and the cover, the, the cover is a plantain tree. And for me, uh, the reason I really like that cover is because for me, that is Puerto Rico. I thought that was Puerto Rico. Sugar is like the whole thing. And here's Puerto Rico, this uh, small part of the colonial experiment, maybe. Um, there we go. There is the cover of the book. Um, 
Well, I have one more question before we go to the audience questions. Um, is there going to be another book? You mean like? Well, I don't want to be specific. I don't like to know if there's a secret. Oh. But really, I think just what's up next for you? Well, you know, it's so funny because a lot of people have asked me about is there a sequel? Because I never think in sequels. People ask me that about my first book too. And uh, I don't know, maybe um, anything is possible, but I don't see my, I'm not going to be working on it in the next year or two. I don't think so, because I, I'm working on this other novel uh, called The Girls from Humble Park. And that's, that's a part of Chicago that I grew up and that's going to be about four uh, young women in this in the 1970s and also uh, because I'm a I love history um, I'm going to be tracing back their mothers or their fathers to Puerto Rico and why they left Puerto Rico and uh, you know hopefully exposing a lot of terrible political stuff because that's what I like I like to give light to the dark and you do an excellent job of it. Um, and as well as that historical piece that you love, um, you know, writers are able to paint a picture from their minds, but the way that you integrate factual things, it's really fascinating. And I think that's another reason why it's so relevant to the Hispanic chamber and the Hispanic community. Um, for those of you who don't know, Maricel is actually a member of the chamber. Um, she lives between Chicago and Pittsburgh, but she's a Boricua. Um, and we're very, very happy to have her um, today and always. Um, now I'm going to get to a question that we have. Let me move over here. Um, this is from Tori Snyder, the founder of Self Care Senorita. Um, how did you, as a Latina, insert yourself into spaces where Latinas typically aren't welcomed? And I think that she's specifically speaking about um, publishing in the literary world in general. Okay, well, the world in general, oh my, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy being a Latina uh, because um, there are so many labels that people put on us. Like if I ever hear anyone call me feisty again, I might not be responsible for my actions. Um, and fiery and exotic, please don't use those words. Um, and right, am I right? Oh my gosh, you know what? I just started taking it as a compliment. No, I mean, it's not a compliment. They it's, mean it as a compliment, but it's not a compliment. It's <laughs> it's things that we start to hear every day. And like like the thing with AOC, these are things that we've been taught for so long we need to let go. And you're right. We don't need to accept them. And that oh. is a powerful point in the book, especially towards the end in the development of Valentina's character. Yeah. Yes, we don't need to accept them. And, and I refuse to. I refuse to accept them. It is very, very difficult um to um in the uh if you were talking publishing i think that um a lot of it is outside our control but what we can do is support um if we want to see a lot more books by latinas and latinos being written we have to buy them uh the same thing for film if we want to see a lot of uh films with latinos and Latinas and produced by them, then we have to go to those uh, movies because money talks, this is America, I guess in the world, money talks. And I think that if you are starting out as a writer, maybe seek out uh, writers who are Latinas that you like and see if they offer an online class and take their class. And I think that's a good start. Uh, because from that teacher, I did that. I took a class with Queen Christina Garcia, who is one of my favorite writers. I think she's fabulous. And from there, I got some um, idea about what my next step would be. Um, there are also some organizations that are uh, just for um, like writers workshops that are just for people of color, like Vona is one. You can look up V-O-N-A -O online and you might find some writers that you um, you like, and you could see they're teaching a class and take the class. And um, as a writer, what you really need to do is to write, try to get better and just keep writing and don't give up. And I think that's what we have to not give up. <laughs> 
in, in life in general, not just in publishing. Um, I want to share a, a question here that we have from Carmen Malloy. She is the chairman of the Hispanic Chamber. She said, would you consider publishing in Spanish? The way publishing works is I would love to be published in Spanish, but a Spanish publisher has to buy my book and then they get a translator and it's published in Spanish. So I would love it to be published in Spanish. Uh, my agent has sub agents in Europe that is pitching it to uh, different countries, including Spain, Spanish publishers. And uh, I'm hoping that one day that will happen because yes, I would love it to be published in Spanish. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you, Carmen, for that question. Um, Monica Malik, she is a consultant um, and she does many different things. I highly suggest her for all different types of things. Um, she is our events chairperson for the chamber as well. Um, and she wanted to know what is your favorite part of the book and who is your favorite character? Well, I, I have to say that I love both characters, Valentina and Vicente. I really love them both. Um, and um, the favorite part of the book, that's tough because I love all of it. I love the whole book. I love all the characters. I loved writing the good characters and I loved writing the bad characters. Uh, it's just <laughs> each one was a, um, a different type of pleasure. And uh, so I don't know that I have a, a favorite part. Uh, sometimes I, I haven't read the book, I have to say, since um, it came out in the uh, hardcover because I'm really, I've read little sections of it, but I'm terrified that I'll see a typo or not even just a typo, but a sentence that, uh, that'll stump me and I'll think, hmm, that's not a beautiful sentence. What would make it a beautiful sentence? And I can't do anything about it because it's already in print. <laughs> well, I thought that it was fine the way that it is. Um, and again, for anyone who hasn't read the book, it truly is tremendous. I hope that you pick it up. Um, can you tell us really quick where we can get a book? Anywhere, anywhere. It's available at your favorite bookseller, anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, you could get it on Amazon too, independent bookstore. You know, I, I have friends who are in England and, and they were able to get it, but you can get it anywhere. So your local, maybe support your local independent bookstore. You probably need a lot of help right now. That would be great. Are there, what, what do you want to communicate about the book that we haven't discussed before we wrap up? I, um, hmm, that's a good question, Melanie. What do I want to communicate? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I think that I maybe just to say again that I wrote this book for myself and for my uh, for everybody who's Puerto Rican who didn't know their history. Um, I'm happy to say that I've actually heard from a couple Puerto Rican historians who have been uh, happy with the research and who one actually told me that he learned things in it. And that made me feel very grateful because it took many years of work and I'm a fiction writer. So some things might not be uh, exactly correct. And I, and I think that's okay because it's not a nonfiction book. It's not a history book. And I think as a fiction writer, I have a little more latitude, but I really try to be uh, conscientious of the historical accuracy because I saw this book as the history uh, of Puerto Rico um, until a few years after the U.S. invasion and I wanted to um, be accurate about that. So. Yes, well you, you definitely portrayed that in the book um, and I just wanted to say that I wanted to thank um, the Latin American Cultural Union. Um, we consulted with them a little bit about some of the topics that we should discuss. Um, while we are an economic organization and of course we promote culture, that is not our field of expertise. So I hope that we serve them well. Um, I hope everyone picks up the book and thank you all for tuning in. Maricel, thank you for joining us. Um, and 
no problem. Um, and if you guys pick it up on Amazon, don't forget to go to smile.amazon.com so that you can give to your favorite nonprofit organization, hopefully the one named right over there in that corner. <laughs> um, and also, if you want to learn more about our speaker series, visit PM ahcc.org um, and you can see all of our upcoming speakers you can go to links to their linkedin get to know them a little more before they're up and coming and if you want to become a speaker you can email me at melanie marie at pmahcc.org thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next week